So welcome everyone to the Orzarua Beit Midrash. Our summer learning this year is about abortion and privacy uh, in Jewish law. It's less about privacy, I will just tell you, in the sense that privacy really didn't come into the mix of questions concerning abortion in our tradition. And thusly, we'll look at it as a matter of interest at the end of the three classes, but I'm not concentrating on it so deeply. And if it takes us three classes to get through the abortion sources, which sometimes happens by way of Jewish studies classes, you just get stuck in the first topic and not really get to the second, you ultimately will get the, the abortion sources. I want to share these sources with the Kavanaugh, the intention that I believe our tradition should help us deepen our thinking about issues that swirl around us within society as it stands. And it's also a matter of historical study. And to understand the history of our tradition, the history of our people when it comes to questions about our lives, deep questions about our lives. I want to tell you, uh, as a matter of this being congregational learning, that as a rabbi here in New York, as a rabbi throughout my career, there have been times where families have wanted to delve deeply into the question of whether or not our tradition permits an abortion in the instance that a family faces. The very particular type of case that is before them, not a matter of the policy of any movement in Judaism or a general approach like we might be discovering within our sources, nor the laws of the land. Uh, as Jewish communities have throughout history, we have served our people who are in need of abortions during times of whatever the law of the land really was. And it's with the recognition of that history that we are investigating these sources. It's also in the context of our faith and our tradition that I present these sources this summer. They happen to just be so timely, it might seem. But I was thinking about this as a values issue long before any of this was in the daily newspaper. That we as a people have always found the light of our Torah and the light of our halachic tradition to help shed light uh, as or la goyim, as light unto nations. And what about the ideas surrounding, and this is where you have to couple abortion with children and birthing and family building and making, what issues surround this? And we can't but contextualize termination of pregnancies and the abortion issues without contextualizing it in, in the greater sources about our children and what are presented right from the beginning of Torah in this, the book of Genesis and beyond in the Tanakh. Tonight, for further uh, matter of introduction tonight, for tonight's lecture, I want to say that we'll be going back to Torah in through Talmudic literature up through codific literature. There's not much, though there are several sources and a good packet or a scroll of sources that we'll see on the screen. Um, there are not that many when it comes to studying abortion that are pre-17th century. We are going to put our toes in the water of the 17th and 18th century. Class number two, will be more about the very specific cases that exist within halachic literature as chuvot, as responsa literature. We will not get to those tonight because we will build the framework of understanding and approaching abortion uh, from about the age of Torah through, through and including the Middle Ages, and then, as I said, just with a toe in the water of pre-modernity. So, with that, let me begin by making sure the folks on Zoom can see the screen and the sources I'm now sharing. We, people have a packet in front of them here in the Beit Midrash. And so I'll just ask, because I can see Ron. Ron, can you see the source sheet up on your screen? Very good. So this is... Abortion and Privacy in Jewish Law. I've entitled this 
class, the lecture number one, context, the question, and classics. The context of talking about abortion is going to come in the context of family building, of a deep regard for life itself, a deep respect for God's handiwork, for how incredible a miracle it is that women become pregnant, that they birth children and survive childbirth. This is the context in which we want to see this because we're a religious group of people investigating what these sources really say about building an ethical framework for our approaching the issue as an issue, but individual cases and trying to understand that it is about Shalot, particular questions of Jewish people throughout history. And so we begin with the first section, which is bless us with children, the door of door, generation to generation. Already in chapter one of Genesis, God said, after a blessing, be fertile and increase, fill the earth and master it, and rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and all the living things that creep on earth. We have a project and a mission as a human race, and we have a particular place in that history of humanity as Jews to be fruitful and multiply. Many commentators already took off and said, how do we accomplish that as Jewish families? One take on that mitzvah is that a family is required to have one daughter and one son. Another take in the Masechah Sanhedrin will suggest that Jewish adults can contribute to the schoolhouses and the religious learning centers of children and consider those children in a synagogue setting, let's say, like their children and grandchildren because they've taught them an Allah for a bet. This is a way to recognize that the greater family is of importance to us and the children that we teach our own faith and tradition, godly ways and faith in the Lord are important aspects of contextualizing this bigger picture of what do we do when it comes to a time when we are faced with terminating a pregnancy. There are five women that are highlighted in Jewish sources who are barren. There's Sarah, there's Rebecca, there's Rachel, there's Hannah, and there's the Shunammite, whom Elisha visits. We'll just look at a couple of verses to say how much longing is in the book of Genesis for children. This is with a nod, by the way, to those who have real heartache and pain not being able to bear children of their own. May they have a blessing if they wish to build a family that way. And may it be that they feel their contributions to tzedakah for our house of learning is about raising the children of the Jewish family that we are blessed to teach. And this, again, creates this context for the discussion about terminating pregnancy and abortions. God says to Abraham, as far as your wife Sarai, you shall not call her Sarai, but her name shall be Sarah. The hey for Sarah's name, some suggest, is the addition of godliness. I will bless her. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she shall give rise to nations. Rulers of people shall issue from her. This is part of the whole narrative unfolding in Genesis, but it's a narrative that repeats itself. Source number five on the packet. Isaac pleaded with Adonai on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and Adonai responded to his plea, and his wife Rebecca conceived. But the children struggled in her womb, and she said, if so, why do I exist? Now at that point, though we know the story is between and about, who Isaac and Esau, there is a way to simplify, simply look at the source and say, there might be struggles in women's wombs. This is not an 
often read verse in the greater context of abortion. And frankly, I couldn't find a single other biblical commentator or posek, halachists, who reads this verse as having something to do with already a hint that there could be some struggle within a woman's womb. I would like to look at that verse in a novel way and say that there's an indication already perhaps with twins, already perhaps with certain situations within a woman's womb that might require our particular attention. The story does not unfold to present any kind of question about termination or the like. That's not the way I'm reading. But I am suggesting that hidden in Torah, based on a traditional way of reading with finding hints, that the struggle in the womb could be a little bit more representational of a struggle that we will see generation to generation, questions about abortions. When Rachel saw that she had borne Jacob no children, she became envious of her sister. In source six, Rachel says to Jacob, give me children or I shall die. This is a sentiment I've heard from families seeking advice about whether or not new ways of cre creating children are acceptable with Jewish law. And this is a struggle I've heard from people who become pregnant in ways they did not expect to. And if they go through with an abortion, they, like Rachel, have expressed the notion that I couldn't live with myself if I went through with it, this abortion. Again, not a source that's generally looked at as expressing a woman's sentiment regarding her living with herself when considering aborting a child. We are to understand, given the narratives of the mothers of Israel that we live with, that we understand through halachic literature and that we understand because we are close to these people ourselves through me and other rabbis and other decision makers who help families through these moments that some of this struggle with either wanting family or what one shall do when there is struggle in the womb is really a personal issue and a matter of religious pursuit among the family of Israel. In Bachot, Hannah comes into focus. Remember, Hannah is the model prayer, the one we use to model ourselves as prayers when it comes to the Amida. She's speaking to God and mouthing the words, and they think she's drunk, but she's really expressive of her faith. And she swore an oath and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, and will give your maidservant a male child, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall be no razor come upon his head. I include this passage of the Gemara because, again, there's a hint in here about some question about abortion that we will face, and that families will face, and bring to their rabbis within our tradition. She's praying for a male son a male, a son. There are people who have indeed asked whether it was fair to bring more daughters into the world at times of deep impoverishment of the Jewish people, where there were no resources. And in an age where we have tests for the sex of babies, that the question could be asked again in Jewish communities that are experiencing deep poverty might surprise you, but the questions are asked. Hana, praying to God, says, Rabbi Elazar said from the day that the Holy One, blessed be he, created his world, there was no person who called the Holy One, blessed be he, Lord of hosts, until Hana came and called him Lord of hosts. What is the Lord of hosts? 
more mystically, it sounds like the host of heaven. But below on earth, the Lord of hosts, the host of children and family members, God who grants so many children in the world, grant me a child. Hannah said before the Holy One, blessed be he, master of the universe, are you not the Lord of the hosts and of all the hosts and hosts of creations that you created in your world? Is it difficult in your eyes to grant me one son? The Gemara suggests a parable. To what's it similar? It is similar to a flesh and blood king who made a feast for his servants. A poor person came and stood at the door. He said to them, give me one slice of bread. And they paid him no attention. He pushed and entered before the king. He said to him, my lord, the king, from this entire feast that you've prepared, is it so difficult in your eyes to give me a single slice of bread? The context of asking questions about abortion and terminating pregnancies, about the questions we have, either about the issue or that have been received by decisors, halachic decisors, rabbis, and spiritual women who are advising families who will come into focus as well long before the advent of women as rabbis or the new rabbinical schools where women are ordained, or are ordained. We will see that these are indeed struggles. The greater context of building families is so strong in our tradition that Yiddish tachinot, prayers for having children, were said either at candlelighting on Shabbat, at Yantiv, or when a woman went to the mikvah. This is an English translation of one of those from Seder Techinot in Prague in 1712. I entreat you, O God, who graciously remembered our mothers Sarah and Hannah, have mercy upon my lamentation and remember me with the blessing of fruitfulness. Let our union be blessed with a strong and healthy child in whom we may replant a connection to your holy name in the ways of the Jewish people. Hallow our lives with your attention to this lofty matter. God, you know our pains. You know the painful, empty heart of the childless. Have mercy and redeem us from this pain, amen. So it is that we consider the topic of abortion, knowing that some had deep pain struggle within the womb, knowing that some had the feeling in their hearts that they may not be ready to bring children into the world, that there are many reasons why we must investigate the topic of abortion in our time. While we are concentrated as a people on the preservation of existing life, before potential life, as the sources will bear out when we look at the abortion topic? Can we say that it's the ultimate value in Judaism? There are competing values. The preservation of existing life, of women and mothers, and the notion that we seek to build a Jewish people full of children, healthy children, who can indeed do continue along our great traditions and their faith in our peoplehood and God. It was the wilderness generation of children who ensured that when the first generation was called to their time. It's an instinctive reaction of parents to protect their children. First, heroes take the bullet. So why will it be when we start looking at sources that sometimes we protect the mother though and the woman herself? If this greater context of building a family and children are so important to the Jewish people. We'll consider in a lecture to come the ideas about abortions during 
times of anti-Semitic persecution, times of famine, poverty of the Jewish people. Times when people ask questions about pursuing religious studies or intellectual goals and thought to abort. We'll talk about the question that came about that limiting the number of daughters in an age where we can test for sex. We'll see that sources related to harlots and adulterers and what happens when women are raped. We'll see and sense that from pre-modern to modern times when we get there, that mental anguish and suicidation play into the Jewish legal reasoning about whether or not women can and should choose to terminate a pregnancy. Genetic syndromes and an instance from the Holocaust about the terror of our world will amplify some of the fears and worries that people have who are using contraception these days and get pregnant and grapple with a, whether or not they should, by legal standards in Jewish tradition, have an abortion. But before that, after this introduction about the importance of building family and having children and pining after this generation to generation role that we have of knowing that we have a role to play with door by door, there are times that we have to understand Jewish law has dealt with the need and the desire for the termination of pregnancy, for abortion. Let me take us to a first topic that will give us some sense of the broader overview then of the fetus growing in the womb all that promise that we've laid out and all that hope that individuals have and yet we're asking the deep questions what is the status of a fetus so that we can understand the questions of may we abort and when is abortion appropriate is there a period of time that was defined by Jewish sources in which an abortion was allowable under Jewish law? Does that notion of trimester that we live with in our public discourse get noticed by the Jewish sources of long ago? And what more do we see in terms of the broader sweep about the issue itself and the status of aborting a fetus? Let's ask the question squarely, the sources suggest. Is it murder or is it permissible by law for some legal construct allows us to adjudicate the matter as if we were not indeed taking a life. So those are the questions we're about to embark on and the first sources will deal with the fetus. In source 10, Rabbi Simai delivered the following discourse, what does an embryo resemble when it is in the bowels of its mother? Already the rabbis did indeed start asking about the fetal development that we must concern ourselves with. Folded writing tablets. That's what it resembles. Folded writing tablets. Its hands rest on its two temples, respectively, its two elbows on its two legs, and its two heels against its buttocks. Its head lies between its knees, its mouth is closed, and its navel is open and it eats what its mother eats and drinks what its mother drinks but produces no excrements because otherwise it might kill its mother these are somewhat wonderful 
scientific understandings for the age of the rabbis. And it moves forward to a little bit more of a, a lovely drush. As soon, however, as it sees the light, the closed organ opens and the open one closes, for if that had not happened, the embryo could not live even one single hour. A light, oh, here's the drush part, a light burns above its head, and it looks and sees from one end of the world to the other. As it is said, then his lamp shined above my head, and his light I walked through the darkness. And do not be astonished at this, for a person sleeping here might see a dream in Spain. And there is no time in which a man enjoys greater happiness than in those days, for it is said, were you enjoying those days? Oh, that I were as the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me. Now, which are the days that make up months and do not make up years? The months of pregnancy, of course. It sounds like they're speaking about experience, about human experience in the womb. If I'm to read Nida, the Gemara, as informing my understanding of what experience an embryo, a fetus, has within the womb, I'm now getting a sense that the rabbis are animating this experience, or at least describing in some way the experience of this embryo who is in this world of the womb. And he taught me and said unto me, let thy heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. And so the baby is learning the commandments. And this is that famous spot where the baby in utero learns the mitzvot. When the converse of God was upon my tent. Why the addition of, and it is also said in case you might say that it was only the prophet who said that. Come in here when the converse of God was upon my tent. As soon as it sees the light, an angel approaches. In other words, when it's born, the baby, and it sees the light of day. An angel approaches, slaps it on its mouth, and causes it to forget all the Torah completely that it learned in the womb. This, this narrative section is, in many ways, for the rabbis, not as important as legalistic sections that will discuss the fetus, the embryo of the fetus, vis-a-vis -vis the mother's body, whether or not it has status as a person under the law and whether or not we are able to abort up until the time that the baby has seen the light of day. But I would suggest that in a more expansive reading of sources, as we are really allowed to make, especially as we read halakhic literature, who reads more expansively some of the narrative sections of Talmud, and in our own approach as modern Jews to take some of the passages of the Talmud a little bit more, not only as literary, but as indicative of some of the thinking of the rabbis, that perhaps this is the, the thinking that, well, there is experience for this growing potential life or life form in the womb. There is learning going on. There is listening. Don't we see in today's world some parents playing classical music, speaking to the Ema's belly, introducing all of the voices of the family to the child in utero? So already the rabbis might know that, that there's some experience, and that is going to weigh into whether or not we are truly allowed to permit a termination, an abortion. Just to keep in mind the ethical framework and how we're relating to this as such a serious question and that it shouldn't simply be for the rabbis, and this will be borne out by sources, just available on demand because there is no real life form within the womb. This narrative of Nida suggests there is a real life form within the womb. It is learning Torah, despite the fact that an angel comes, knocks it on the nose, and it forgets everything. But yet, they will seek to protect 
the mother, and they will seek ways to explain to you a little bit more about how to define the time period of pregnancy in order potentially to make some decisions about this issue of termination beyond others. In the Gemara and Yivamot, vis-a-vis early period in the pregnancy, we have a source that's mentioned by many Jewish legal decisors when it comes to deciding whether or not this embryo or fetus is a life form. And that is, if she is found pregnant until the 40th day, may ba'almahi, they call it, it's only mere fluid. This kind of thinking might have been the kind of thinking that gave rise to the early notion of the ability to say, let's simply rid the womb of the water, flush out the womb. In fact, there were certain kind of suppositories and certain kind of herbs, let's call them medicines, but not exactly like modern medicine, that were used and and even mixed in terms of recipes and then recorded in early medieval medicinal journals, Jewish included, when it came to certain recipes they thought might spur on a miscarriage. I can't imagine they worked every time and even the majority of the time. But especially during the early days, this source is called upon to say, in the early period, it's simply fluid. And the womb could be fl- flushed out. In Gitin, we have a, a very central source that defines an approach to fetal life. And the question of whether or not there is something distinct and particular about finalizing the the opinion that ending the life or the or the poten, of the potential life within the womb is feticide. If it's something distinct and apart, the fetus from the mother then perhaps I always have to rule that it's feticide, that there's a separate category of killing a fetus. But if it's not a separate entity, and I go that direction, as it says here in Masechet Gitin, then I have a different issue under the way we adjudicate matters of law. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi holds, no other than Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, who's the editor of the Mishnah and a well-respected figure among the sages. He says, a fetus is considered as its mother's thigh. Ubar yerech imohu. And if it's as its mother's thigh, that is a part of the mother's body, and it has... It's as though the master transferred ownership of one of her limbs to her. This becomes a very different way of thinking about the actual fetus. And as we'll see, going back to Torah, in the book of Exodus, it's going to be this line of thinking that has taken the Jewish sages in terms of their reading of a passage in the book of Exodus so that they can define the loss of a fetus as the loss of a limb and By doing so, 
they keep it from being defined as the death of a fetus as an individual for which capital punishment would be required. To say it a different way, if I go with the notion that a fetus is simply like a limb of an individual and there's a terrible accident and the limb is lopped off, I have a way of adjudicating the matter in Jewish law, according to the Gemara and Baba Kama. I say, what would that limb be worth if that person was doing good work throughout his or her life? And I bring that matter to the bait dean and I say, what's the going rate on the market for someone who's got both limbs and now someone who's got one limb? I get the financial penalty but I want to assess the one who delimbed the person, the one who committed the crime, and I fine them as opposed to charge them with some corporal crime or capital crime. And so that's going to play a role in how we think about the entire issue of abortion itself. Is it just water in the womb fluid for the entire pregnancy no that's just for 40 days is the baby the fetus and baby as it develops simply a limb of the mother until the time that it sees the light of day in nita again to point out the 40 day from conception notion she need not concern herself with the impurity of childbirth if the baby is aborted if the if she miscarries 41st day and forward she does indeed need to concern herself sounds like there's childbirth according to a position in the talmud with masechet nida at 41 days and beyond maybe that's suggestive of the fact that we would consider this fetus developing baby a person and thus want to protect it at all costs because it's a life as we define a person who has a life but again if it's a limb it's quite a different story and even if it was a person, are there, and there will be, Jewish sources that grapple with the one person who's sitting and obviously learning Torah within the other one, at least according to Masechet Mida? What do you do when there's a real struggle in the womb and you need to consider terminating the pregnancy? Just to bring in the notion that the Gemara talks about souls and the idea of soul and how we use it to define whether or not someone's a person, that's really not relevant within halachic discourse. I just bring you a source in number 14 that says, at what point is the soul given to a human? But just in terms of their question, you see that they're grappling with, when is a person a real person? Is it from the moment of decree that such a child will exist? In other words, decree meaning the moment that there's fertilization? Is the soul assigned? Or is it from the moment of formation? And does that formation suggest its formation within the womb? Formation as a person outside when it sees the light of day? Rashi on Sanhedrin says the moment of decree when his flesh, tendons, and bones come together. Source 15. The moment of formation when the angel comes to the drop and brings it, it, that should be it, before Hashem to see what will happen to it. As we say, immediately a soul and life is thrown into it. So there seems to be some grappling. The point being, we, there's grappling with when life truly begins. There's suggestions that it's just a limb. There's suggestions that it is a whole person with experience even in the womb. And yet there's still going to be some grappling about when they're struggling, again, within the womb 
and what we do when it seems like there needs to be a termination of pregnancy. To further inform how we think about this fetus, I bring you a small passage in Nazir, which relates to a dead fetus within a mother's womb. Again, we're sensitive that these sources have us grapple with very, very significant issues of life and death. And that if anyone uh, in the Beit Midrash here on Zoom or, or here in the Beit Midrash has experienced these things, I, I, my heart goes out. Uh, the Gemara reminds us that we have people around us and people in this world who experience just very difficult, difficult pregnancies and experiences with childbirth and, and all of it really comes into focus. And I just want to hold that as well while we're, while we're studying the sources. Rabbi Yermia raised another dilemma. Does a dead fetus in its dead mother's womb form a mixture with regard to her so that the bodies are considered like two corpses buried together or not? Simply the question alone indicates that the rabbis are really grappling with the status of what is this fetus? What is this child in formation? What is this life? And how will we adjudicate the matter? So the deep dilemma we're faced with is whether or not abortion is a capital crime. This will be the way that some modern post scheme boil down the issue. And if they, as public figures, by the way, come out with very serious platforms or positions about the issue, most of them, I'm talking 99%, will still say to someone who struggles, who comes to ask them the Shiloh, might we have to do this? May we do this? They will most likely not perform their stump speech about abortion, but they will be sensitive to the hearts and minds and souls of the women who approach them and the families who are grappling with it, and they will help them find the right posek. Because even though you all know the joke that you go to the rabbi who's going to give you the answer you want when you have the question that you want to ask, in many cases and in, in many of the suggestions that we even find within the articles that go back through these matters of asking questions about abortion, we see that those who even took strident positions on one side of the issue or another, it's not murder, it is murder, will help the people who are asking the questions find the right posek, find the right halachist, the right rabbi, to help them through the issues that they face. Okay, so before I get into the now even more crystallized question of term terminating pregnancies and capital crimes, uh, let me stop here, take some questions, take some uh, comments. If you've got them, I will be looking both in terms of the Beit Midrash here, and hopefully those on Zoom will be able to hear the folks in the Beit Midrash as they speak. We've got the microphone set up here. I hope that it's going to work. And if you have a question or a comment out there in Zoom land, please put, use your hand. Uh, Diane has demonstrated how to raise that hand on the bottom of your screen, or you could just kind of wave at me, and hopefully I'll see you. But Diane or Aaron, uh, yes, let, let me start with you. So I'm interested in the fact that the rabbis are talking about 40 days, and 40 days, is, it's, it's all fluid. Because the, the law in Texas is six weeks. That's 42 days. And it, it's just interesting to me that it's very close to what the rabbis were talking about. Yeah, what I, what I meant to suggest by noting that back in history, we have had some thinking regarding terms and numbers of weeks and days and months 
um, was already an investigation by Chazal, by our sages, who were also part of their world. Um, and, and you had an Alexandrian school, you had a Palestinian school, you had uh, the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Jews all thinking about these things, and there are parallel texts, and several of them indeed mention that period of time. Yeah, how? Maybe you covered this, I missed the first few minutes, about the origin of life, uh, of, that it begins with the breath. The breath is the, is the uh, period or the initiation of life. So when a baby comes out of the womb, it breathes and that's when the onset of life, if you will. But you know, medically, the fetus starts breathing activity or practice breathing at like 10 weeks. And then over time, the lungs mature and the, and the muscles mature until such time as they're, they're born. So my question has to do with the idea of life beginning at, at breathing and where, where the commentary is on that. Is it post delivery or is this practice breathing which is present roughly 10 weeks, you know, is that considered you know, holistically the, the beginning of life in, with using that as a, as a metric? So, so far, I've brought you one source in Nida, which was a more narrative source that had some midrash within it that talked about the baby seeing the light of day. And this phrase is most of what we get by way of that question you're posing, as opposed to breathing. God breathed life, of course, into the body of Adam, the, of humanity, of the first human being. But seeing the light of day or having and as we'll get to a source in a few minutes, having its head emerge is really the pinnacle moment of counting the infant as part of those people who live in this world. I'll just say it like that, because even in the womb, the debate is given the experience of even they are learning Torah or practicing all those physiological things you made mention of, there seems to be a source we'll get to that suggests that they're not interested in so much defining when is the moment of life, though they are grappling with when does the soul come in, when do we really count it within the, the group of people that we consider alive and living, and re remember, some will even argue, and again, we don't necessarily hold by this, and we comfort people who lose infants, stillborns. We bring, even we bring them to the cemetery, and we have a special place within the cemetery where we do inter them. Uh, but we don't necessarily, according to tradition, have a requirement to name them before that covenantal moment that we create some ceremony. And that's just as a matter of compassion. More, they thought it might be compassionate, and for some it is, that they don't have that kind of con conception of life, uh, as, as you're making out, particularly about the physiological and biological kind of realities. Okay. Yeah, Cliff. These are this is Cliff in the Beit Midrash, who's not on your screen speaking, so. I'll try to talk loud. I don't know if you can hear me. So we're two questions. I don't know if they're connected. Number one, assuming a, a couple is trying to get pregnant, how do you determine the day of conception to count to 40 and 41 days? And secondly, is there any evidence of, of some type of burial service for stillborns? or fetuses at some stage. Um, I know that stillborns and, and babies that don't survive 30 days are typically buried at the margins of a Jewish cemetery. Um, right. So if, if, because that would be an indication that they thought of, of this living organism as human life, if they bury it as human life. So what, what I'll, did you hear the question out there in Zoom land? 
on on the first matter mm -hmm. just remind me um a couple is trying to get pregnant oh yeah how do they count yeah so we're, i don't want to get into the sources about the counting mm -hmm. with more medical knowledge we obviously are more, more able to determine and those post scheme who relate to scientific knowledge and especially in our world who relate to this we would have a, a very specific count and i'm not sure though that it really matters any longer by way of specific counts except for the fact that diane just brought up the fact that there are places that seem to want to make the rules about how long and how many days and how many weeks and how many months that is only one approach and for sure not the only jewish approach that we take for being permissive in allowing for abortions on the second matter there's not i don't believe you have to totally equate human life as we understand a human being with being buried on the margins of a cemetery because let's say god forbid i had an accident and in the heavy machinery of my gamara learning i would uh, slice off half a finger because i slammed the book on but whatever i would want to still bury that in the in the margin of the cemetery so it's human material that i want to treat with dignity and so it's not just the, it's not defining of a human life to treat it like that so different again different cemetery societies and 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 post scheme will say whether you have to do that burial or you don't whether you have an option to do it or not and based on the individual's consultation with authorities and what will bring the most comfort to a certain family we do have ceremonies in fact where we do some of that uh, in in rabbinic manuals of late you will find liturgies that certain people have tried to create and for miscarriage yes and they're and they're being rewritten all the times to find ways of expressing the kind of compassion and comfort that we hope for okay let me go further i want to get into the next set of sources i want to ask the question in the next set of sources uh, about capital crime and whether or not we really are taking a life because it seems to be that there's a lot of question about this you know is it a life or is it not a life frankly my before i start into the sources what i'll tell you about the post scheme is that if it is a life if it is a limb there are times when jewish post scheme according to our tradition will allow an abortion all the way and again this has been thrown back against rabbis who have explained this to very very deep American religionists, let me just put it like that, has been thrown back in their faces, and I'm for sure not suggesting we are uh, completely permissive of this type of approach for anyone, for any reason, on any given day of the week. But there, there are post who will say, up until the very last moment of pregnancy, before that baby has reached the light of day, a woman's and a mother's life takes precedence. And so let me get you to the source before we start dialoguing about it, because it will come up in this section. Here we go with capital crimes. Yes or no? It says already in Genesis, as we found ourselves contextualizing the whole matter within the building up a family and the questions about pregnancies that might arise within the Tanakh. We found ourselves in Genesis for, for that section. Let me locate us in Genesis for this one too. Whoever sheds human blood, by human hands shall that one's blood be shed. For in the image of God was humankind made. The Hebrew is important here. I'm not sure why you're seeing panorama of United States Let me stop to share. Uh, there's some line about the panorama of the United States court building at dusk on my screen. I don't know why. Okay. Well, I guess it was meant to be. You're, I don't know if you can see that when I share my screen that there's a, some line about. No? Okay. So good. <laughs> Funky. Wait, some people said yes. I didn't see it. I see it. Right? It's very strange. Oh. It's blocking my my pasuk. Okay, here we go. 
So it says, Shofech dam ha'adam ba'adam. This word, these, this couplet, ha'adam ba'adam, gives rise to the notion that we are talking about a growing fetus within a woman. The one who sheds human blood of the woman growing inside a woman. Ha'adam ba'adam. The humanity within humanity. The fetus growing within the woman. This is a typical way that the Bible has been read by some post king who want to say generally already in Genesis were challenged with the notion of ever terminating pregnancies meaning as, as an endeavor of medical necessity even. But then it's read even more strongly by certain religious faith groups who see it as the ultimate message. Now remember, for Jews, reading a verse strongly is Talmudically a hava amina. We are not Torah Jews in the sense of we ever leave one read of a verse and never question it. This is not a way that we approach individual cases, especially, let alone coming up with positions and platforms. But perhaps the suggestion is that when you're building your thinking, when you're building an ethic around this topic, you should be very mindful that during the days of Noah, when they were given laws, we take very seriously the notion of what it means to shed the blood not only of human beings, generally in the sense that we understand the verse, that if, he, if you ultimately take someone's life, you might face capital punishment. We also see this as a verse that says, if you are going to allow abortion in society, in amidst your community, you need to take this very seriously. For in the image of God was humankind made. Now, I told you we'd get to Exodus, but before we get to the Exodus case that discusses the legal status of an aborted or a miscarried fetus in this case, I'm just going to remind you that, and I don't need to remind this group, but the Ten Commandments come along, and it says don't murder, and we're worried. Is this murder or is this not murder? And we want to know. And we are concerned with that, and, and we know that murder happens only for a person who, in the status of our legal system, is indeed a full-out person. And we have, what, two witnesses, and they know that the person had some state of mind, mens rea, and or premeditation, and that they were warned, and that they, despite the warning, went ahead with the murder, and then we charged them with the... Even with all of that, we still have capital punishment on the books. We take life that seriously that it could remain on the books, despite questions of whether or not we had courts that actually administered it, by the way. But if the person or the human or the fetus, which is, let's even say, the limb of a mother, is affected or impacted by two men when two men are fighting. And I see that the Torah does not require me to charge the attacker with capital punishment, but I find the attacker who creates the miscarriage. I find them because I don't consider the growing fetus an actual human being then I've got a legal framework in which, under the Jewish legal system, the miscarried fetus, even what has been 
created as of late and is not a term that is ancient, medieval, or even pre-modern, but late term fetus, even if that's the case, I don't have a way of saying that this is a human being and that informs my approach to the overall questions of whether or not I can permit abortions in general. Here's the case. When, when men fight and one of them pushes a pregnant woman and a miscarriage results, but no other damage ensues, the one responsible shall be fined according as the woman's husband may exact from him, the payment to be based on reckoning. So a miscarriage happened, and now I'm fining the attacker. That says in our legal system that it was as if a limb was lopped off the woman who will now be economically less valuable in the sense that she might have work she could do. Rashi. He shall surely be fined to pay the value of the offspring to the husband. Now, is it the offspring? We estimate her value according to what she is worth if she was sold as a slave in the market, giving her a higher value on account of her being with child. Oh, Rashi might be suggesting in his read that it's not just about a limb, that it is about the child, and we lost the entire value of the child. In that case, I don't read it as if the fine is because this is a limb, according to the Gemara that we read before, but I now look at it with Rashi's commentary and I say, wait a minute, maybe the economic value was the child's life. But even still, if it's only potential income because of her pregnancy, and it's not capital crime, and it's not capital punishment, but that he is simply paying the fine, then I'm still adjudicating the matter within the system of fines and economic penalties that have to do with compensating victims for their economic losses. And economic losses go back to women or slaves or men losing their limbs and not being able to do the work. Now, the Christian tradition reads this very differently. The Christian tradition, when it translated this section, and it might be that certain Americans really have digested the Christian tradition. The Christian tradition in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, uses the Greek for the notion of the disaster that took place. And the Greek translation of ason, the disaster that happened, is not just miscarriage, it's the miscarriage of a child which has been formed, or a life that was formed. Since the Greek translation was the material that the church fathers preached early on in the development of church theology, we see the rare, in terms of historical record, the reconception, to not use a pun here, that's a terrible one, the, the reinterpretation of the Hebrew of Exodus 21 took place. Now, Sanhedrin will indeed pick up on that verse from Genesis and in the Talmudic corpus suggest that descendants of Noah or non-Jews really should not kill fetuses. Here's how that works. Rabbi Yaakov Baracha found that it was written in a book of Agadot in the study hall of Rav, contrary to the halacha with regard to a Jew, meaning 
it is permissible for Jews to terminate pregnancies given the circumstances we're about to learn. Again, I haven't brought you this central source to the entire endeavor. A descendant of Noah is executed on the basis of the verdict of even one judge and by the testimony of even one witness. There's not the burden of proof on that non-Jew in terms of the courts. And this is a reflection of how the courts were being developed by the Romans, which is why Sanhedrin says it like this. It's not actually prescriptive. It's actually reacting to what's going on around them by way of Roman culture. He can be judged or testified against only by the mouth of a man and not by the mouth of a woman, but even a relative may judge his case. So they didn't allow women, as was the case, but they did allow the relative, as opposed to us who didn't. The sages said in the name of Rabbi Yishmael that a descendant of Noah is executed even for killing fetuses. It is stated in that book of Agadot that the sages said in the name of Rabbi Yishmael, a descendant of Noah is executed even for killing fetuses. The Gemara asks, what is the reason for the opinion of Rabbi Yishmael? The Gemara answers, it is derived from that which is written, one who sheds the blood of a person by a person, by Adam, his blood shall be shed. The courts, the law, must hold for that society that killing fetuses is wrong. Because the proliferation of abortion during the time of the Romans' rule was worrisome to the rabbis enough to have them write into Sanhedrin that they could be prosecuted for it. This gives rise again to that piece of the Jewish puzzle that says, even though we're going to allow some abortions to happen and even late abortions, we are careful to say that the larger ruling class in this case, the Romans, from Masechet Sanhedrin's perspective, but in all cases, for all generations, the societies in which we live, that we want B'nai Noach, the peoples of the world, to be very careful about how permissive they are with abortion as a possibility. And this is what is going to ultimately be expressed in some later sources that we won't get to tonight. But we'll take a look at in terms of the beginnings of the 18th century or the beginnings of the 19th century when it comes to suggesting a read of this kind of Gemara in Sanhedrin. The Genesis. If I will, if I may. In the Middle Ages, in the Jewish community, there was some real sense that we did not want to permit as many abortions as might be taking place within society. Why else would the Zohar state in Source 25 as, as explicitly, he who kills his sons, it is told about an it is told about an embryo that was killed in its mother's womb, that it is deconstructing God's buildup of creation and his omanut, art and faith making. Listen again. There might have been a time when choices around bringing life to the world were so difficult that women were faced with and families were faced with decisions to end pregnancies in the way that they could at that time. And the Zohar, which is our source, closest to the everyday lived life of Jewish people in terms of its relationship to halacha, which is embedded, Jewish law, embedded within this mystical poetry. And we might say that because so many halachists went back to the Zohar to include how to do Shabbat and how to live yantiv and how to celebrate Jewishly by looking at the Zohar and including and incorporating a lot of it, also with the Sabbath, from liturgy to ways we put bread on our table, important down the line in the 16th century, but as important earlier on in the creation of the Zoharic literature. The Zohar has some statements about the attitudes regarding social policy. And the Zohar here says, careful. Because when you allow it 
to simply be a matter of choice for all, for any case, is the implication here. It is deconstructing God's buildup of creation and his omanut, art and faith making. By way of a Jewish ethic, then, even if we were to say we, we want to see abortion possible to protect mothers and women, we have to seriously consider the messaging of the sources we see in Sanhedrin relating to the non-Jewish societies we live in and our own society based on this one passage from Zohar, which has its parallels in other places as well. We're so intent on protecting life and every individual possible life that in the laws about capital punishment, you remember that in Sanhedrin 4 or 5, it says, therefore, Adam, the first man, was created alone to teach you that with regard to anyone who destroys one soul from the Jewish people, kills one Jew, the verse ascribes him blame as if he had destroyed an entire world. A more expansive read is to say, anyone who kills any human being has destroyed an entire world. But what do we do when we know that there's a struggle in the womb, when we know that there's a danger to the mother? I'll move us into the classic expression of when abortion is indeed permitted, which informs an overall Jewish approach to the topic. Source 28. A woman who is having trouble giving birth. And I give you enough of a sense that these sources are very graphic sometimes here, so that you're not shocked by the content. They cut up the fetus inside her and take it out limb by limb. Because her life comes before its life. Yatsa rubo, but if most of it had come out already, ain no ginbo, they do not touch bo, it. Meaning what? The life that's exited the mother in this difficult childbirth. She'ein dochin nefesh mipne nafesh. We do not push off one life for another. Perhaps if you've heard any source about abortion, could everybody mute out there? We're hearing somebody's phone ring. Perhaps if you've heard any source about abortion, you might have heard this source. The Mishnah says that until the majority of the baby is out of the birth canal, saw the light of day, one may cut up the fetus inside her and take it out limb by limb because her life comes before its life. There are those who want to say it applies only in very specific cases when there is the potential that the mother will die in childbirth. There are those who read it more expansively to say that she has got a real struggle with the pregnancy, that it could cause her disease. It could even, in modern times, directly impact her health in ways that would be detrimental and even deadly. This is the source that we look towards in order to understand a permissive approach, not without the greater context, and not without an individual posek reading the Mishnah, in order to try to understand how to deal with the fact that if that baby is most of the way out and the woman is on the delivery table, we are to deal with the situation. Because it seems like there is a Mishnaic mandate to touch neither. And this might lead to two deaths. 
And then the question would be asked, based on our medical experience, what's the approach we should take? In fact, there are different approaches, but it's not without deep reflection. What is it about this fetus that's developed all the way towards that moment when it just may be born to the world that allows us to take its life, to call it what it is in this sense of the text, a life. And that framework will emerge in the Sechet Sanhedrin. Now I'll get to questions after I present the section. <clears throat> if the head emerged. Now, Yatsa Rosho is how the Gemara presents the case. But is that <clears throat> the Nusach? Is that the actual manuscript of the Mishnah that we saw above? No. Above we saw the majority of the baby had come out. This gives us some place to understand different approaches as well in the ancient world. An indication of different manuscripts reflects attitudes of those either copyists or writers themselves who are recording for themselves the Mishnah's teaching. If I record Rubo, if I say the majority of the child comes out, and that's the manuscript that I have on hand, that's very different than saying its head comes out. Because most cases, outside of breech births, outside of those cases with feet, that head is crowning first. But if I say majority, I've got somewhere past the shoulder for sure. And it's a different, physically different case. Just to point that out by way of maybe one's approach and why we have manuscript differences to begin with. But the Gemara says, if the head emerged, we do not touch him since we do not push away one life for another. Why? It is a pursuer, a pursuer who was chasing another to kill him. Say, He's a Jew and a child of the covenant. There's why. This is a Jew, a child of the covenant. How could you possibly say he's a pursuer and that he's pursuing someone to kill her and therefore you have the right to take his life? Ah, but the Torah said, the one who sheds blood shall his own blood be shed. So when you tell me that it might be a pursuer and that I could fit it into the category of the pursuer, and you decide to take its life, you've got blood on your hands. Meaning, save the blood of the pursued by the blood of the pursuer. Oh, wait, but the suggestion here might be something a little different in the Gemara. So let's read it the way that the Gemara's poetry wants us to now look at it. If the head emerged, we don't touch him since we don't push away one life for another. Why? Isn't he a pursuer? Can't we take his life because he's about to kill the mother who's giving birth? A pursuer who was chasing another to kill him. Ah, but you might argue with me and say that he's a full-fledged Jew, a living being. I can't possibly kill him. No, you could define him as a rodef. You could define him as one who's pursuing the mother to kill her, and therefore... I save the blood of the one being pursued by taking the life of the pursuer. That gets, that gets codified by the Rambam, by Maimonides. Mishnah Torah, murderer and the preservation of life. It is a negative commandment 
that one should not protect the life of a rodef. You don't protect the life of a pursuer. For this reason, the sages ruled that in the case of a pregnant woman in a dangerous labor, it is permissible to dismember the fetus in her womb, whether with a drug or by hand, because it is like a rodef pursuing her to kill her. However, once the head is emerged, one may not touch him. As we do not set aside one nefesh life for another. And because the text used nefesh as opposed to rubo, rosho, the majority of it, its head, its body physically, but now we use the word nefesh. This is the natural way of the world. We don't take one person for another. Hmm. So now we have the Rambam using the construct of the Talmud, but limiting it to exactly where we sensed the Gemara started that used the word head, not the majority, the rubo that the Mishnah used, the majority of the body of the baby. And we are left with this notion that up to the moment it comes to the world and sees the light, as it said in Nida, in the Gemara, it's possibly in the category of Rodef pursuing the mother, and we have to save her life. But once it's not, we really have to see that we're taking a viable life. This understanding, of course, is set against the general tide that feels as though earlier on terminations versus later terminations are allowable by law. But in the Maimonidean code, which then moves, and we don't always paskin like the Rambam, we don't always decide like the Rambam, this is where a general approach Jewishly stands. Limitations, of course, will be a matter of seeing that potential life as a life unto itself, and ba'adam, if there's life inside a woman's womb, reading that verse from chapter 9 of Genesis, that I can be held liable for capital punishment for a capital crime if I allow this termination, if I am actively engaged in an abortion. Finally, the Rambam will state again in source 32, a non-Jew who kills someone even a fetus in its mother's womb is executed. Even if he kills someone who has an incurable terminal illness or tied someone up and placed him in front of a lion or he let him starve until he died, is liable since he caused someone to die. Similarly, if he, is, if he killed a pursuer, we don't, right? We don't have this. 32 was cut off. 32 was cut off. There's a 13 of 13 pages missing. Okay, so all right, let me let me reframe this source people, then. The Zoom people have it. The Zoom people have it in front of them, yeah. but the Beit Midrash people don't. You see what you get with Zoom? You get an extra source for the same price, <laughs> and they don't have it here. Just let me hold off then. If I was to end with if I was to end with that last source that people in the Beit Midrash have, which was the Mishnah Torah, murderer and the preservation of life source, the negative commandment that one should not protect the life of the Rodef, and we are allowed, and it's permissible, to dismember the fetus in her womb, whether by drug or by hand. However, once the head is emerged, it uses the head and not the majority of the body. And I leave it there. 
we are indeed creating a framework for an approach that a POSEC may take, a, a halakhic decisor might take to the issue of abortion that allows for a very, very difficult decision to abort a baby for the sake of the mother and her life, even up to the last moment before it's born. So that is a review of the sources. I'm going to hold off on those other ones that I started to read and to tell you now that we've got ourselves, our heads, around the majority of... Uh, <laughs> oh, terrible. terrible. Sorry about that. We've, we've, we've got now a, re a review of the majority of sources that we have to rely upon within the Talmudic corpus. And we've added a little bit of the narrative sources and sources from the Tanakh that precede all this question of termination regarding families and the buildup of Am Yisrael through their children. We've got a general read of an approach. So uh, before I end it with another couple of reflections, I want to take your comments and your questions to here, and I know Matt uh, had one in the midst, and if you can remember it, we'll take it now. What was it? It was partly, partly answered uh, by Rashi, um, but um, in Source 28... Matt's asking about Source 28. I'll set, I'll set it back in the screen. Yeah. Um, the, the English translation has, in those two sentences, the word life. It's only in the second sentence that it uses nefesh and nafesh. Um, it's chayeha and chayav in the first sentence in that source, which is an interesting distinction, but the uh, uh, Sanhedrin, Rashi, and and uh, Rambam just address nefesh in its own. There, there's some difference with nefesh, and before that, it's pi. Right, right. So Matt's asking about the language of the Mishnah, which over here has the words chayeha and chayav, which which is life, and you might think that that's what we're really going to focus on, right? But they focus on nefesh tachad nefesh which is really the Torah's expression of making sure that you understand a full status of an individual. And we use that in the legal framework as a full status individual. So I think that's why you get the emphasis on nefesh, tachad, nafesh, and not necessarily this pickup of the life. But, how, but however you look at those, the, the Mishnah has both expressions. And so at that point, we're dealing with life. That's to say, in a Jewish approach to the topic, it's not a, it's not a question or an argument about, is it a life or is it not a life? Is that what's going to be the deciding factor? That's really why I think we have to see these sources for what they are. The rabbis are fully aware that there's life here, that there was potential life here, that there's life here. But you've sometimes to adjudicate between who's the pursuer and who's not, according to the Rambam. And, you know, one of the problems with the Rambam, with approaching it like the Rambam does, is that if it's in the context of a pursuer and someone about to be killed by a pursuer, and therefore I'm allowed in defense of that person to kill this person, I've now contextualized it within the framework of capital crimes. And unless I have a way to work myself out of that context, which some posts can do, I'm stuck in the capital crime zone. But he's simply giving it as an example, according to many commentators, so that we get a better sense, given the capital crime framework we have for really being able to rise up and take the life of someone pursuing somebody else, this is why we have that same kind of value, because we're really protecting the innocent life, the primary life here. And what is that at that moment? The life of the mother. 
Other comments, questions in the Bay Midrash out there in Zoom land? Yeah. Yes, Sheila. Uh, I simply want to ask about your perspective lectures, because I, I think the question I'm going to ask would be jumping the gun, and that is, do you plan to discuss the differences in approaches of various, uh, not just Jewish individual interpreters and philosophers, but of now various divisions within Judaism and how they approach the question. Well, here's the thing that I want to say about that, and thank you for the question. Um, individual thinkers versus divisions or, or movements. There are no divisions and movements who think monolithically. So I just want to make you aware of that from the get-go, that we will see incredible, orthodox, well-respected, post-scheme of the generation, decisors of our generation, fundamentally disagree with each other. In terms of our own movement's approach, next time we start with a very specific tshuva, uh, response to literature, from our, from our world, from, from, from a very, very important legal thinker within the context of uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary and the Wissenschaft School, uh, the, the folks who think about Judaism more scientifically and historically, and we'll go through some of that responsa literature to begin with, having read these sources and be informed a little bit more as readers because we did the study we did today uh, in terms of an embrace of halachic literature we're about to explore. Thank you. Michael, Michael. So I, I appreciate very much that in this initial session, what you wanted to do, hopefully I got this right, was to lay out the key source sources and considerations upon which we would dig into as we move forward. Is that correct? But my head is sort of hurting around the fact that I'm trying to rationalize this into some kind of construct. And it seems to me that there are two question. One is the question that you just dealt with at the end, is the subordination of the fetus's life, if you will, to the mother's. Okay? Obviously, that's nuanced too, because the question is, what does that constitute? Right? right. And we'll see some of the relationship to that question in the more recent halachic literature. So, but because we read that mission in Oholot, we'll be better informed readers of modern halachic literature on the subject. Right. The second piece I'll, I'll call derived from our obligation for doing nefesh. So the question now is, under what circumstances and in what situation, not putting aside, putting aside, um, um, the fact uh, cases where the mother's life is not in jeopardy are we as Jews permitted to abort a fetus? Here's the, here's the rea reality of fir first, first response is it may be the Jewish approach to understand the sources about the non-Jews versus the Jews as Jews are permitted, non-Jews are not. And we even see a time in historical circumstances where a non-Jew runs to the Jewish community because they follow that Talmudic dictum where their own doctors don't do abortions, but they know Jews do sometimes based on very careful analyses. We didn't use the construct of pikuach nefesh that you brought up, saving a life. Some in this subject, adjudicating this subject, bring up the notion of whose life are we really talking about and who, when it comes to subordination and or whose comes first, they want to talk about whose nefesh, and there's that word nefesh, yeah. nefesh, and that's one of the other reasons why we use that nefesh term and hang on that term. Because to really think about whose nefesh we're talking about and how we apply saving an individual or allowing an individual to say what they need in order to thrive and survive, that's going to come into play again, in pre-modern and modern literature uh, in, in this discussion. We're not there yet, 
the ethic that I tried to build tonight was not just the sources that are important in that vein, but also the greater context that individual Jews come and they need to know. In this case, what is my answer? That's the religious approach that I'm taking, that this is a matter of life and death sometimes in family life and for women particularly, who are the ones who are pregnant. And what I tried to do is show you that there are sources that inform those who are thought partners in that. So these sources, most of them are the ones that are used in that process. And I brought some other ones as well to, to talk about the ethic behind it. What's the Torah really trying to reveal to us by way of our needing to grapple with these issues? And what's the value system inherent within thinking about abortion in general that come to light? Can I, can I just make one other comment? Can I just see if somebody else has oh, a... Sure, sure, sure. Does somebody from Zoomland have a question or a comment to make? This is called wait time by way of education. <laughs> I'm just making sure, just making sure. Thank you. I, I don't see anybody's hand. I'm sorry if I'm missing you, but okay. Yes, Sam. Uh, the question is hardly critical, but it occurs to me, and that is, have there been studies of the commonality or lack of commonality of rapes of Jews over the years? I, I don't know about them if there have been. So I'm going to leave it at that and say that we have had halachic literature that deals with the cases of rape. And we have modern post scheme who take differing positions within the same world when it comes to rape. And we will see what they say in a lecture to come. I want to thank everybody for really being here for summer learning. You know, we say we all go away for the summer. Here we are. And this is a great group. I really appreciate that everybody made time for Talmud Torah with me. Uh, we want to wish a refuah shlema to everyone who needs one. May this learning bring you strength, courage, and for all our loved ones who are ailing. And wishing everybody a great Shabbat to come and a 4th of July weekend that celebrates the very best of who we are as a nation and all we can contribute to it as Jews or as being a, a bright light in and amidst the American Kihilot, the holy congregations who have so much to contribute to America. Name. Shalom. Thank you, thank you so Shalom. much for making this a, for making chat? a Zoom option. You're welcome, Diane. I appreciate that so many people wanted and requested as well. So it really means a lot. Much to appreciated. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. I think that was good to offer as an alternative because, frankly, Rabbi, people are afraid to go out at night in the morning. And this permits them to be able to participate.